Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in today's video we're going to be doing something more speculative. We're going to try to find out if it's possible for us to create a habitable world around a supermassive black hole that you see right there in the distance. In other words, is there any way for us to generate a world that is somehow habitable around a black hole? Welcome to What The Math. Now you may have already seen the video uh, that I made previously or may have read the article by Sean Raymond where he actually generates several habitable worlds and the entire habitable system around a black hole using stars. But we are going to be doing something different. We're not going to have any stars. We're going to do a little bit of science and try to find out if it's possible to actually have a habitable system, habitable zone and habitable worlds without any stars simply around a black hole. How is it even possible, you may ask? Well, black holes might have several ways of doing this, but we're only going to be taking a look at one, orbital velocity. All right, so let's go back a little bit. Let's create a completely new system, and let me actually show you the math behind this and try to explain it to you by using our own supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. We're going to place a few um, Earths around it at different distances, including Earth that's relatively close to the Sagittarius A star, just so I can show you what's going on here. We're also going to decrease time and basically watch what happens. So first of all, this Earth right here uh, has a velocity of about 50,000 kilometers per second, orbital velocity that is, and is slightly farther away than a normal Earth would be from the Sun. This Earth is a little bit closer and its velocity is significantly higher at 52,000 km per second. This one is within about one astronomical unit, 59,000 km per second. And the closest one here moves at close to 100,000 km per second at a distance of where Mercury would be from the Sun. But here is a problem. And the problem is that, as you may have noticed, these closer Earths start to basically fall apart really quickly due to the tidal effects uh, that are pretty large at this distance from Sagittarius A star. You can actually see the tidal effects by going into the motion here and looking under tidal stress magnitude. So for most of these Earths, the tidal effects are large enough to basically either completely break them apart or to cause tremendous, tremendous tsunamis, earthquakes, and so on. So in reality, none of these Earths are actually going to be habitable simply because of these ridiculously powerful effects. So Sagittarius A star uh, will probably not be a good example for us. But there are other black holes, way, way more massive than Sagittarius A star, that might actually um, create something viable. And so we're going to imagine this is the biggest black hole we've ever discovered, known as Ton618, whose mass could be up to about 66 billion masses of the Sun, versus 4.3 million for Sagittarius A star. In terms of size, boom, this is how big it is. Very, very big. It's about 1300 astronomical units in radius. At this point, if I were to place more Earths here, at no matter what distance it is, even if it's right at the edge of the uh, Schwarzschild radius right here, the tidal effects are absolutely minimal. The tidal effects for this black hole, simply because of its size, are going to be doing absolutely nothing to us. So we can actually have quite a lot of planets placed here and they're going to survive just fine. And this Earth right here, the closest one, is moving at speeds of 210,000 kilometers per second. That's about two thirds of the speed of light. As a matter of fact, I can actually change this, and there you go, 0.7 light speed. Now, this is where things get a little bit more interesting. You can actually increase this even further, but I'm only going to go this far just to demonstrate my point. So at this speed, the relativistic effects kick in and they actually start doing a lot of really weird things uh, on this planet. But one of the things we're going to be looking at is the background radiation. 
CMB, also known as Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, uh, deserve its own video, which is coming very, very soon. But basically, this is kind of the map of it. And all you need to know is that right here on Earth, we are currently receiving CMB from pretty much every direction. This is the leftover radiation from uh, about 377,000 years after the Big Bang. And uh, it's it used to be very, very hot, it used to be high frequencies, but over time, over distance, it basically got redshifted to a much, much, much less energetic, very, very low in the wavelength um, type of radiation. Specifically here, we're talking about the value of about 160.23 gigahertz or about one millimeter in terms of wavelength. Now, this means that at all points, pretty much from everywhere on Earth, we're receiving the radiation of about uh, one millimeter in wavelength. But if you know anything about moving at close to the speed of light, there is something called blue shifting. In other words, there's a, hypothetically a way for us to blue shift microwave radiation to make it more visible from Earth and even make it warm up our planet. In other words, if we move fast enough across the universe, the background radiation will blue shift into visible light and possibly even other uh, types of radiation, thus creating somewhat habitable conditions on the prograde side of the planet, basically on the side of the planet that's moving towards something, while making the other side completely dark and basically even colder than before. But if there is atmosphere and if this planet rotates, this means that this kind of radiation can actually be used to warm up the entire planet. So here's the thing. Let's do some math and find out how fast do we have to move to change the one millimeter wavelength into something more visible that would warm up the planet, which would be, I guess, visible spectrum of light, which is usually 390 to 700 nanometers. So in other words, we're actually changing the wavelength and uh, changing it by a value of about two to 3,000. A very quick Google search uh, brings this formula for calculating the velocity when Doppler shift comes into effect. What you need to understand here is that C is the speed of light. Uh, this here is the wavelength and we basically are dividing the original wavelength by the wavelength we want to achieve, which will actually give us something like 1 divided by 2600. And then we're squaring these values and uh, getting a value that will give us the percentage of the uh, speed of light. So I kind of did this pre-calculation in advance and what I got is this number here, 0.999999 85847 uh, of the speed of light. In other words, the, this is the fraction of the speed of light we have to be moving at to turn the background radiation into visible radiation that will actually start warming up the planet. And if you're actually curious about what uh, would actually happen on our planet if it was moving that fast and what kind of time dilation you would start experiencing, we can also plug this in into a time dilation calculator. And we could also use a time dilation calculator right here to try to find out that at this speed, you would be basically experiencing 0.05% of time dilation. Or in other words, the time for a person on that planet would move about 2000 times slower than uh, for someone who would live in a, t a frame of reference that didn't experience these speeds. In other words, if we were to look at this planet uh, from our own planet Earth and try to see how fast people were moving here, they would be moving about 2000 times slower. So time dilation here would be pretty ridiculous. But we're currently are not really experiencing these effects. As a matter of fact, our speed is only 0.7 light speed, which also means that the time dilation here would be uh, much lower at about 71% of the speed on uh, or time on Earth. So that's that's kind of really very ins insignificant in comparison. And so the actual radiation that we're receiving um, from the background radiation is not really doing anything. So we need to increase the speed. At around 0.9 light speed, uh, that's when things will get more interesting. But at the same time, the orbit of this planet will actually change as well. It will become more elliptical and is now going sort of farther away from the black hole. And only at this point right here will it actually reach 0.9 light speeds um, velocity. Can we actually increase it to about 0.99? So this is when it gets a little bit more difficult. 
with every little increase of speed, you'll see how more eccentric the orbit gets. And at some point, it will actually most likely escape the orbit of the black hole. So I can try to go to about 0.984, and this is as far as I think I'll get before the planet escapes completely. At this point, um, the single orbit around this black hole takes about 67 years, and for only possibly a few months, it will be moving fast enough to start getting warmed up by the uh, effects of the background radiation, and it will also experience those time dilation effects. I tried to play around with various black holes and I tried to basically place um, these Earths as close to the edge of the black hole as I could before basically things get really unstable um, and nothing really worked. I don't think there's any way for us to reach the necessary velocity uh, for this Earth to experience these types of dilation effects. Unless of course we're talking about a spinning black hole, just like in the movie Interstellar. In Interstellar, the black hole itself was spinning and was actually moving the space-time around itself, thus giving the planet, Miller's planet, even more time dilation. So that Miller's planet, in reality, would have actually received so much background radiation, because if you remember correctly, a single hour there was like several years. Not only would it be time dilated so much, but it would also be receiving so much radiation on the prograde side that things would be just completely burned um, from, from all of these effects. And I'll actually discuss this in a separate video as well. So what have we learned from this so far? Well, first of all, yes, you can probably create habitable conditions based on really high velocities that could be generated by orbiting really close to a supermassive black hole. These conditions would be generated simply because of the blue shift effect uh, that would be received on the prograde side of the planet. However, getting this planet to move at 0.9999985 uh, velocities of light speed would be very, very difficult unless the black hole itself was spinning really fast, which would then mean getting just the right conditions for this to occur. So if somewhere out there there is a supermassive black hole that also spins relatively fast and generates enough uh, space-time disturbance here that would essentially give these planets a velocity equivalent to about uh, 0.9999985 of the speed of light, that would mean that these planets would be, in essence, habitable simply because of the amount of radiation received from all of this uh, background radiation that's being blue shifted and that generates heat on the prograde side of the planet. But all of this is very speculative, very hypothetical, and there are probably things I'm not even considering here that would make this even more disastrous for the actual planet that moves that fast. Because I'm sure there are other types of energy that are being produced here that I'm not even thinking about. And if you did think of something that could actually happen to these planets moving that fast that I didn't mention in the video, please post it in the comments below so that we can actually come back to this and make another part uh, for this unusual scenario. Now, in the future video, I'm also going to be talking about the Miller's planet and how much radiation it may have been receiving from the background radiation. But for now, that's all I wanted to talk about. And so to answer the question if it's possible to create habitable conditions around the black hole, the answer is probably yes, but there's a lot of things we need to consider to make the velocity really, really high and increase the dilation effects until the planet starts receiving enough radiation from the background radiation. Other than that, that's all I want to talk about. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.